I want to read Hebrews chapter number 12, um, verses 1 through 3. Um, Hebrews is a very important um, book theologically, uh, biblically. It's a confusing book, I must add. It's, it's, it's a little difficult to, to migrate through, but it's an important book. And I, I think on resurrection, many of us have this expectation, or we know the story that Jesus resurrected on the third day, hopefully. And that's why we all come to gather to celebrate the fact that a, a savior was resurrected for you and I. And I know this is going to be a little unique and a little different, but I, I want to take a moment and I, I want to pray. And then I want to do something that's totally different. I, I want to invite those of you. I know it's typically done at the end of the message, but we don't have to wait to the end to invite people to a life-giving life. I, I, I think that the fact that you've seen all these people show up, dress up, to come to a place to celebrate this faith that they have. I, I think even greater than that, if, if, if you have been blessed to live beyond 2020, if, if, if you don't have a ventilator face to face with you, I, I think I think God has spared some of us, even though we don't, let's be honest, even though we don't always pray, even though we don't always worship, God has been gracious to us to give us another chance. He's, he's not the God of a second chance. He's the God of an, another chance. He's, he's not the God of a, a third chance. He's the God of another chance. And, and no matter what you have done, no matter where you have been, he's the only God that doesn't run your credit before he accepts you. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to, re, to a relationship that's deeper than just a Sunday morning experience. You may not do church, but you should do God. <laughs> if you do God, you should do church, by the way. Um, but let me just help you with this. I, I want to make sure that we, can we pray? Because, you know, New Year's Eve, I always pray. And I always pray uniquely that, you know, the, back before COVID, we could touch people's hand, but I, I, we ain't touching nobody's hand today. Uh, but, but what I would say is that you don't know the person standing next to you if they'll be here on January 1st. And so I, I want us to, to, to have a, the opportunity to know within ourselves that I made a decision to follow God. Following God doesn't mean perfection. It's an introduction to the ability to go deeper in a relationship. How do you start? Make a decision, number one, to follow God. You can't get yourself together and then follow God. God has to get you together. But secondly, what's most important is discipleship. It's like mentorship. You need to be trained in your faith or you'll just have a faith that grows crooked. Discipleship allows your faith to grow right. I want to pray, Father, there are people that are here under the sound of my voice that are here because you called them. They're not here because they drove here. They're here because you called them. They're not here because someone invited them. They're here because you called them. So at this moment, I pray they respond to the calling of God upon their life. God, they may not even know why do I feel the way that I feel, but God, you are the one who draws. And I pray right now you would draw them by your spirit. So Holy Spirit, as we give this invitation, let those that don't know you, that may be far from you, come to know you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you're in this place and you're like, PD, I don't know why you did it this way, but I feel it. I feel like I need to reconnect, recommit my life. I ain't here to judge you if this is your first time, second time, or third time. I need to recommit my relationship to God. If that's you, would you just lift that hand slightly? There we go. There we go. Keep it up. I need to see it. Keep it up. God bless you. Keep it up. Keep it up. I need to see you. God, keep it up. I need to see it. Keep it up. There's help. There's hope. There's healing. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. If you're here and you're like, PD, I need to get my life together. I don't know. I, I, I tried to do it on my own. I want to get some intervention, divine assistance in this. Would you just lift your hand? I want you to keep it up. If you're ashamed of God, you'll be ashamed before man. God bless you, man of God. God bless you, woman of God. Here's, here's, here's what, God bless you. Here's what we're going to do. I, I want us to pray. It's not just the prayer that makes you saved. It's the sincerity of your heart. 
Like no man can judge you, only God can judge you. We can judge your fruit, but only God can judge your eternal soul. So when you're going to pray this prayer, I want you to know that saying a prayer just acknowledges that you want to be married to God. The marriage is a different thing. You actually got to live it out. You actually got to live out these vows. But this is the start. The next step that I want you to do, very practical, I just want you to get your Bible every day and read Proverbs. Just one chapter every day. For whatever day it is, read it out the Message Bible. You Google the Message Bible. Proverbs chapter number 5 for April 5th. Proverbs chapter number 6 for April 6th. I want us all to repeat. Those with the hands lifted, keep them lifted. It's a sign of surrender. It's a good sign. You're not being stuck up by no officer. This is a good sign. You're being held up by God's grace. Repeat, everybody repeating with me and with your fellow brothers and sisters. Father, I come to you, a sinner in need of grace. I know my sins crucified you to a cross. I repent of my sins. I ask you to help me live for you every day. Father, I pray that you would guide me, mature me into a believer that I might bring your name honor and glory. Father, I thank you on the third day you resurrected for me in Jesus' name. Now, second step, I need you to do this, the last one. I want you to text the word Jesus. Grab your phone, grab your phone. I want you to text the word Jesus to 407-449-8884. 407-449-8884. Text the word Jesus, 407-449-884. Now that you got the ultimate vaccine that can save your soul, I want to teach you something that I think is so critical to your faith. I think it's one of the most critical messages in the culture that we need to know. I want to read Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, when people die, when people end up losing their life, they go, and if they're a Christian, they go and become a crowd of wit, be a part of the great cloud of witnesses. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured, he endured the cross, scorning the shame and sat down at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Father, breathe life to this passage in Jesus' name. I want to talk for a few moments, for a real quick moment, before your stomach growls. From this thought, joy and pain living in the same house. I think the duality of faith is joy and pain will reside in the same house. Back when music was really good, the artists Frank Beverly and Mays wrote the song, Joy and Pain. Sunshine and rain. <laughs> He also says the same place that brings you the most love also brings you the most pain. Jesus knows to be a follower, one must manage the tension of these two cycles of life. You can't have one without the other. 
You cannot have joy without having pain. They are neighbors. They reside together. Joy and pain live at the same residence. Hebrews, who some believe was written by Apollos, most traditionally believe is written by Paul, deals with Jesus heading to a cross, which is pain. But for the joy, he accepted the assignment. He valued the pain that was assigned to him to bring him into purpose. Can I suggest to you that in order for you to get into purpose, you first got to travel through pain? He valued pain because of purpose. I believe this concept of joy and pain is one of the most difficult concepts for Christians in today's culture to accept. After all, we live in a culture that teaches us how to escape pain and live our best lives joyfully. Littered throughout scripture is the tension of joy and pain. Hebrews even speaks of considering Christ who endured, who is the pioneer of our faith. May I suggest most people see brands and they recognize a brand. If I were to tell you the Nike check, you would say, oh yeah, that's Nike. If I were to give you the Toyota emblem, you immediately got it in your mind. If I tell you the Louis Vuitton brand, you know the LV, then you know that's the Louis Vuitton brand. If I tell you the Gucci brand, you know the G and the Gucci brand. If I, if I tell you the Reebok brand, you, you know the brands because brands speak to something. It speaks to the identity of a thing. But isn't it strange if you're thinking a little bit that when Jesus decided to choose the brand that would represent Christianity, he chose a cross? I mean, if, you're, if you really want people to follow something popular, why wouldn't you make it a crown so that people would be like, yeah, I want, I want to sign up for a crown. I, I want to be a part of that. But he picked a cross, and a cross in that day was was one of the worst symbols you could ever see. It was a symbol of torture. It was a symbol of suffering. It was a symbol of shame. It was a symbol of judgment. It was a symbol of harsh punishment. And Jesus used this brand and redeemed it. What was once not a popular thing to wear around your neck has now become a fad that we wear with our jewelry and we wear it proudly, not recognizing that cross simply means that when I signed up to be a follower, that means I'm going to experience what my pioneer experienced, joy and pain. <laughs> and he says, lay aside every weight. You know, in a false expectation can be a weight. If you believe something that's wrong, and it doesn't come to pass, you could be upset at a thing because you had a false expectation. If you expect everybody to bring you a gift on your birthday and they don't bring you a gift, you're going to be very saddened because your expectation wasn't met. And maybe a lot of us in this room looked at 2020 and looked at God sideways because we had an expectation that God never promised. Can I get an amen in the quiet church? A false expectation can be a weight, but the joy that was set before him, it was a future joy, and Jesus has a future joy. And I want to I wanna show you that in order for you to get the purpose, your entire body got to lay on the cross. Now, I know you want to live your best life, but there's no living your best life without your entire body hanging on a cross. Your head got to hang. Your mind got to hang. Your arms got to hang. Your legs got to hang. Your back got to hang. Because you got to feel every aspect of purpose that God has called for you to do. I want to let you know there's no skipping the class. There's no going through a fast track. You, you've got to learn how to balance out joy and pain. There's no skipping just to joy without having some pain. And some may say, well, how in the world are you always smiling? That does not mean that I don't have pain. It simply means that I choose the side that I choose to lean on. And joy and pain 
are very important because they live together. And most of us have learned how to navigate through joy. I don't got to spend a lot of time teaching you how to celebrate joy because a lot of us know how to do joy. We, we know how to do that. Joy is an easy thing. You, you know joy is the thing that you know how to do. You know how to be happy. You, you know how to enjoy having money. That stimulus hits your account. You know how to celebrate. You're thanking God for money back, Joe. You know all these things that we do. Joy has a way of keeping you, but, but joy is one when you're online. I praise God because I'm alive. I thank him. How you doing? Blessed and highly favor. That's easy, but what happens when you're not in joy? When you got to live on the other side of your cross, which is called pain. Uh, don't, don't get it twisted. How many of you grew up with grandmas that served God, loved God, or mamas, and it seemed like their Christian experience was full of pain, but their confession never changed? They would sit there in the midst of stuff that this generation or culture would say, I'm done with, I'm finished with, but they would sit there and say, you know what, God is with. I know people who have died serving God and ended up sick in the hospital bed, tubes in their mouth, and when you go see them, they're saying, I'm just praising God because he's good. How is he good with two, because they understand joy and pain live in the same house. I can't just celebrate the good days and then turn around the days of pain and say, where are you, God? I don't understand you. They both live in the same house. Jesus on the cross is stationed between joy and pain. One man says, you, you the son of God, come, come when you go to heaven, bring me with you. Don't, don't forget me when you go. And then on the other side is pain that says, if you really were the man, we wouldn't even be here. You would have got yourself off. And isn't it amazing that how you can have good days and bad days wrapped up in the same day, that you could have a good day and an email make it a bad day, but you come home and your kids run to you and you lift them up and then you have a good day, but it's still a bad day, but it's still a good day. At the same time, I want to teach you how to manage the pain. Jesus was stationed between joy and pain. The joy of knowing that I'm going to the Father and I'm going to be in a heavenly place and I, and I won't suffer as long as I'm suffering right now but the pain and agony of the people that he loved that crucified him. He wasn't crucified that people that didn't know him. He was crucified by people who studied him. He was crucified by people that he was born to help. His purpose was assigned to help them and when he was assigned to help them, they crucified him. What do you do when the people you're called to help kill you? What do you do when the family you love crucifies you? What do you do when the friends that you aided and abated, they end up crucifying you? You're just living the life of joy and pain. What do, you, what do you do when you get married and it's a season of joy and then you realize that joy got overshadowed by pain? What do you do when you're single and you've been waiting a while and then you think you finally found somebody? Then you find out you've been catfished and then you're sitting there saying to yourself, how can joy and pain live in the same house? How in the world could a child bring you so much joy and then you got to go visit that same child in prison joy and pain live in the same house how can a body be strong enough to let you run a race and let you do extracurricular activities and then later on let you get sick to where you're bound to a bed joy and pain live in the same house how many of you have tensions with parents and one season they make you happy another season they make you mad joy and pain living in the same house. It is amazing how we celebrate the joy and crucify the pain. But it is the pain that is a requirement to position us into promotion. Jesus understood that pain placed me in a position as Lord. Without pain, I could never be Lord. Without pain, you will never be what God made you to be. Without the tension of life, you will never be what God called you to be. Without the tension of life, you will never be what God called you to be. Here's something I want you to write. 
premature exit out of pain will push you to an incomplete promotion. Premature exit out of pain will push you into incomplete promotion. Exiting doesn't mean you won. It just means you weren't mature enough to grow into joy. Say it one more time. Exiting doesn't mean you won. It just means God realizes that he's wasting this trial on you because you're not going to grow into joy. See, trials and pain are de designed and developed to bring you into promotion. Here's the interesting thing. Pain is an indicator. It's also a locator to where you're hurting. You can't tell God how to heal you if you don't know where it hurts. You can't develop a deeper relationship with God until you experience pain. I know that's not popular preaching, but I got to tell you the truth because the only way you're going to pray better is when you get pain in your life. The only way you're going to know how to go deeper in your prayer, I pass, I want to learn how to pray deeper. You don't want to learn how to pray deeper. You don't learn how to pray deeper. You go through things that make you go deeper. You encounter things that make you go deeper. You just don't happen to wake up and learn how to pray for 30 minutes. You go through enough hell and high water and then you start saying I need some time I need to download this screen time and I need to invest in some more face time why because you learn through pain how to get better here it is I want to tell you that pain brings promotion I want to tell you that pain brings promotion you can't be promoted without pain there's a thing called growing pains my little baby boy, he has a new tooth coming in and it's starting to hurt because you can see the new growth behind the old growth. And in order for the new growth to come in, he's got to go through some pain of the old growth being pushed out of the way. And some of you want to get new teeth in. You want new things to come in, but you don't want the old things to be removed. And it is painful when God starts removing the old things. Now, let me tell you, my son doesn't have Novocaine when the tooth is being removed. He's just got to learn how to go through the pain. And I just, and my wife and I just got to encourage him that we all been through that season. It's a season of new growth. And when new growth is coming, sometimes pain comes first. Pain sometimes is an indicator that growth is coming. Sometimes pain is an indicator indicator that something is wrong, but sometimes pain is an indicator that something is coming. Number two, pain brings about performance. 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 If you don't change, pain will make you change. If you don't change, pain will make it. Oh, baby, I don't need to pray for you to change. Just let enough pain come in your life, and you'll begin to change. Just let enough tragedy come in your life, and you'll begin to change. Pain is, a, is an initiator to bring performance. When God wants us to change, he often sends pain. You thought you are, we thought we were all that in a bag of chips till 2020 hit. And people who didn't even know God start saying, well, I need to ask about this God because I, I need to figure it out. People started getting scared. People started praying more. People started looking up church more. They started looking up God more because pain is a megaphone to your soul. You want to know how to get humble? Let pain come in your life. Pain knows how to humble you. It will bring you real far down. God knows how to use pain to perfect us to where we need to be. Pain brings precision. enough pain, you'll be more precise on what you do. Some of us are too old to experience more pain. So we're cautious on what we do because we don't want more pain in our lives. It teaches us how to be more precise. Pain brings precision. Brings precision. Brings precision. It helps us clarify the whys. If I'm going to go through that, then it must be worth something. If I got to experience that, then it's got to be for something. Number four or five, pain either poisons or positions. You know people are bitter in this room right now because pain made you bitter. Pain poisoned you. It didn't make you better because the choice is yours. Pain could either poison you or it can position you. 
I don't care what happened in your life, pain could either poison you or it can position you. Pain could either poison you or position you. Jesus hanging on the cross, he didn't let their pain poison him. He could have got off that cross and said, man, I'm done with this. But he knew that pain will either poison you or position you. And he understood that how you manage pain is important. Because a lot of us know how to manage joy. We just don't know how to manage pain. If you got to drink your way out of pain, you don't know how to manage it. If you got to medicate your way out of pain each and every time, you don't know how to manage it. Because we all will deal with pain. I don't care if you went to Harvard. I don't care if you went to Yale. I don't care if you got six figures in your account. I don't care if you're on welfare. We all will experience pain. Pain is the reality of life. It is part of life. It is how life will be lived. And pain will either teach you how to position yourself or poison yourself. Pain positions. Let me tell you, y'all, having the faith of Jesus, having faith in Jesus is not the same as having the faith of Jesus. The goal is not just to have faith in Jesus. The goal is to have faith of Jesus. I want to be able to be in a season of pain and trust that my life is not in the hands of pain. It's in the hands of someone greater than the pain that I feel. That takes a lot of maturity. That takes a lot of maturity to know that how you're feeling right now, I'm in a lot of pain because you don't disacknowledge of what you're going through because that's disingenuous. I am in pain. But I trust that God's got a greater plan with this pain than I got for myself. No, that's not being false. That's not acting crazy. That's being realistic because if you don't learn how to talk yourself right, you'll talk yourself wrong. You got to learn how to talk yourself right. No, this hurts, but I believe this pain is working for my good. I, I don't know how it's going to work for my good, but I believe it's working for my good. Not everything that doesn't feel good doesn't mean it's not working for my good. I need you to know how to manage pain. Pain is, 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 is something that you and I need to learn how to manage because it'll either poison or position you. Someone you trusted that walked out of your life could either poison or position you. You could either be mad at the world. You could either say that, and it is real. You could say, I can't stand humanity. Or you can say to yourself, I'm going to position myself. I'm not going to let anybody's decision make me a prisoner to my pain. You live the event. Don't live it forever. you got to make a determination that pain is not going to be your prison. And Jesus hanging on the cross is teaching us how to handle pain. No, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. There are going to be moments where it's hard to breathe. There are going to be moments where it's hard to think. There's going to be moments where it's so overwhelming, you just want to shut the door and be away from everybody. But here's the thing. When he died, he died in pain publicly. Which shows us that there are some seasons where God won't let you hide your pain. There are some seasons you're going to have to walk it out publicly what you're going through. There's some seasons you're going to want to log off and not tell anybody about your life because they know about your life, but maybe you got to ride through it because pain can't just be private all the time. Sometimes pain has to be public because in order to have a public resurrection, you also have to go through public pain. You can't want God to resurrect you publicly, but then give you the pain privately. Sometimes you got to live it out both publicly, and you got to learn that resurrection is coming. You got to learn that God will never let you go through something and give you something inferior for what you went through. God will not let you offer up your Isaac and not have a ram in the bush for you. God will never let you have something inferior when he offers up your own body. Trust me, it may not come today. It may not come tomorrow, but you got to be like I was when I was 12 years old back in Boston, old school. Y'all know, y'all fancy. What we used to do is we used to catch the city bus, and when we used to catch the city bus, we didn't have the GPS to let us know that it was coming because you only had a beeper and a type flip phone. What we had to do was just sit there on the bus and look out to wait for it to come. We didn't know when it was coming. We just knew that we were around the right time. It didn't always come at the 
time it said it was going to come, but we knew if we were around the area at the roundabout time, it was eventually going to come. And what we'd have to do ever so often, once we got tired of sitting, we had to motivate ourselves to keep waiting. We had to get up and take a look because we knew eventually that bus is coming. Now, the best part about the bus coming was that we heard it before we saw it. And sometimes pain is an indication that something is on the way. Sometimes pain is an indication that it is coming. But not just that, y'all. Pain teaches us how not to be faithful to wrong assignments. Pain teaches us how not to be faithful to the wrong assignments. There's nothing worse in life than going through a whole bunch of stuff that you weren't assigned to go through. Maybe pain is not just a locator, it's an indicator that something is wrong and sometimes pain is an indicator that something is right. When you get pain in your hand because you put it on a stove, it's right letting you know that something is hot. When you get pain in your head, it's letting you know that something is wrong and you need to look at it. So pain could be a locator and an indicator that something is wrong or something is right. And maybe you might be going through pain in your life in this season and it is an indicator that something is wrong, that you need to make some adjustments, that you need to make some changes, that you need to make some adjustments of clarity for your life because there's nothing worse than living a life that God didn't ask you to live. And there's nothing worse than chasing a dream that God never authorized. There's nothing worse than spending three years in obtaining a dream that God's not even in. Sometimes pain is an indicator you're going the wrong way. Sometimes pain is an indicator that what is coming is a sign that is going to be better than what you've been through. The old saints used to say it like this, and I'm landing this plane home that if I'm going through all of this, there must be something on the other side. Let, let me just say it again. The old saints used to say, if I'm going through all of this pain, there must be something on the other side. Let me say it one more time. If I'm gonna hang on this cross, and endure all of this frustration and endure all of this aggravation, there must be something on the other side. Can I make it plain to you? It's just like a woman that's pregnant. She's pregnant and she goes to the hospital. The pain lets her know she needs to go somewhere. She needs to go somewhere that can help her deliver what she's carrying. It's, if Without pain, she doesn't know that she needs to go somewhere. But she understands that it takes a level of pain to give birth to something she enjoys. And some of you are carrying something and you're feeling a lot of pain in this season. And the pain is an indicator that you need to go somewhere that can help deliver what you're trying to carry. The worst thing in the world is to feel pain and stay where you are. You need to get the pain and let it take you to somewhere that can develop what you're carrying. And a lot of us have had miscarriages in the spirit because we felt pain, but we didn't go where we could get delivered. I'm not going online when I'm carrying something. I'm not going on social media for, for help when I'm carrying something. I've got to go to a place that has been proven to deliver. But when a mama carries a baby, she knows joy is coming, but she's got to live through the pain. And if she don't live through the pain, she'll never carry the joy. And if you don't live through the pain, you'll never carry the joy. But before the baby comes, something happens that I think is spiritual and I think it's interesting. When Jesus was on the cross, they pierced his side. Blood comes rushing down and water comes rushing down. When that happens, it lets him know that he's about to die. He's about to be entered into a greater position than when he once was. When a woman's about to give birth, her water breaks. It's a simple sign to me that there is help coming to you on the other side. You know, water is always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. 
that God sends the Holy Spirit to empower you to be able to give birth to something that's painful. And some of you have been trying to give birth to things without the Spirit of God. And that's why you find it so difficult, and that's why you find it so augmenting, and that's why you need the presence of God to help you deliver what you're carrying. And when God sends the water, it is a sign that breakthrough is next. When God sends the water, it is a sign that breakthrough is next. And I know you got a little mess on you and you're trying to figure out why this mess is on you. But can I declare to you something prophetic that maybe God is breaking your water to let you know something new is coming. And maybe God is making you uncomfortable to let you know something is happening. And maybe you just started giving your life to God and I want to speak this over your life that God will begin to break your water that your water will begin to break I'm not talking about a natural break I'm talking about where God sends the Holy Spirit upon you that allows giving birth and makes it easy for you some of you have been going through a season and you don't know why you've been going through so much pain well, maybe God is trying to birth something in you you've never birthed before. You can't rest at night. You can't sleep at night. You feel agitated. You eat and you're still hungry. You drink and you're still thirsty. Maybe there's another level called next for you. It is an uncomfortable time, but God uses pain to position people. He uses pain to usher people into the space that they need to get into. And pain is not God being against you. Maybe pain is God working for you. Maybe you may lose some things to gain some things, but God will allow pain to happen in your life because it is an usher. It does seat you in places that you could not seat yourself. It does bring you into things that you could not bring yourself into, and pain is a necessary tool. But pain if it's bad enough, will make you open your mouth when you want to keep your mouth closed. You don't got to motivate people to be praisers. Let them go through enough pain, they'll change their testimony. You go through enough pain, you, you stop worrying about what they're saying, what they didn't say. You become a praiser by yourself. When you got enough pain in your life and you look over your life and you say, I've been through so much, I done went through so much, I done lost so much, I've been in a season of pain for so long. That is why pain is the ability to make you say a thing that you don't want to say. Have you ever had a headache so bad you just need to go in a closet and scream? Have you ever had stomach ache so bad that you need to go out and scream out somewhere? That's what pain does. But God will use your pain to make you a good praiser. God will use your pain to make you a good worshiper. God will use your pain to begin to birth something in you that you couldn't birth within yourself. And I know you got masks on. And I know you got your suit on. And I know you got your dress on. I know you got your hair did. I know you got your makeup done, and I know you got your nails done. When Jesus was on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice. 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 Out a loud voice. Because some pain, you got to say something. Some pain, you can't fake it. Some pain, you got to say something. Some pain, you got to open your mouth. You know why you're so frustrated? Because you try to keep it on the inside. I, I didn't graduate from all that. Pain and opening your mouth doesn't mean you're weak. It just means that if I don't let this out, it's going to make me explode. It's going to make me go out. Pain will make you open your mouth. It got so bad that I couldn't hold it again. I couldn't hold it in myself. It got so rough. The divorce got so bad. The child molestation got so hard. The job loss got so bad that I could not hold it in my Myself. I had to say something. The marriage got so bad that he's not home, she's not coming home. I had to not fake it anymore. And I had to say something because pain will make you say something. Pain will make you grow. Pain will make you grow. Pain will make you grow. It's got to be bad. What? Y'all got 
one minute, 38 seconds. What I thought was interesting was that when Jesus was in pain, he didn't shout to the people that were next to him. Because there's nothing worse than opening up yourself to people who don't have the power to heal you. So why should I allow you to watch me bleed when you don't have the power to heal me? Some of you are going for help, but you're just not going in the right place. God has to give you enough pain so that you can open your mouth and say something. I, I know, I know this is not therapy, but I do know it is therapeutic. I know it's not therapy, but I do know it's therapeutic. I'm tired of you wearing your nice clothes. I'm tired of you wearing your nice stuff. But when I talk to you and I look in your eyes, I see nothing but pain in your eyes. I saw you dance, but you're empty. I saw your post. It looked like it was full of joy, but it was full of pain. You wanted people to congratulate you, but it didn't anesthetize your pain. You bought a new house, and you walk in it, and you're still in pain. Got a big diamond ring, and you're still in pain. Got a new office, and you're still in pain. I just want to know, at what point of your life are you going to turn it around and say something to a God that can help you? Say something to a God that can hear you. I just want to know, maybe you opening your mouth may be the thing that breaks your water. Maybe it may be the thing that opens you up to another level. I don't know, but I do know that most of the time in Scripture, when people were going through arduous stuff and they opened their mouth to God, God responded. There's no way in the world that you could say something to God and God not respond back to you. There's no way in the world. Can I close with this story? I remember going to the beach last year, 2020. I had so much going on. It was absolutely the worst season of my life, one of the worst. But there was navigating joy and pain. Highest real estate career, most painful experience. I went to the beach, went to New Smyrna, and I put my headphones on, and it was in the middle of the day, and I just started screaming at the beach. And there was no one on there, so they, they, no one could hear me. There were people far away. And I, and I started to scream at the beach, and, and I knew God could hear me, because if he could control the oceans, he could hear me. I, I started looking at how big this ocean was. I drove out there by myself. I text my wife, I'm going out to the ocean. If, if you call me, you're not going to reach me. So I went to the ocean, just started screaming. And I started looking at this ocean that's so big has a boundary that it cannot cross. So I started screaming to God, and I just started, just, just started tripping, just tripping, just tripping. And God let me scream. God never interrupted my scream. I mean, I had to be screaming for a whole long time. If people were around, they probably would have called 911. And then all of a sudden, when God was like, are you finished? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I saw some seagulls. And it tripped me out. And these seagulls, they were all were gathering. And I started ducking because they were coming into my head. And I, I thought for a moment maybe God was sending birds to attack me because I was screaming. But what was happening was seagulls were going to find worms that the shore, had, that the water had brought to the shore. Come on, church. Let me say it again. These big birds were landing on the shore because there were worms or food being pushed to the shore. So God, in his infinite wisdom, thought so much of birds that he made the ocean, which is so vast, so big and so large, he made the ocean cough up food because the birds were chirping that they were hungry. And they landed on the ground and were able to eat. And at that moment, I realized that, God, why am I tripping? If you take care of the birds because they open up their mouth and you, feed, you cause this big ocean to feed them, how much more will you feed those that love you? 
I'm just trying to get you to say something. That if you are in pain, if you say something to your father, he will respond. If you say something to your Abba Father, I didn't say say it to the church. I said say it to God. I didn't say say it to your friend. I said say it to God. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to say something. From the balcony to the floor. I dare you to lift your hands and shout something to God. Say something to the master. This is for pain tolerance. This is for pain tolerance. This is for pain tolerance. What you doing, pain tolerance? What you doing, pain tolerance? How you managing it, pain tolerance? Make it till you make it. Say something till you make it. Pain tolerance. Pain tolerance. If things been stripped from you, pain tolerance. There is joy on the other side. But you gotta endure pain first. survive your faith if you don't learn how to manage pain and joy. You can't have joy without pain. They're Siamese twins, y'all. If you're going to master this thing called life, you're going to need God to teach you how to manage joy and pain. Your best days are ahead of you. Your most painful days are ahead of you too. They both live together. You gotta learn how to dress up and navigate through pain and joy. Maybe this season it's a lot more painful for you. Maybe it's a lot more joyful for you. But we all live in matter how successful you become, you'll have to learn how to balance joy and pain. My, my prayer for you is that you won't give up because of the pain. And, and let, let me not get it twisted when I said don't, don't go to others because you're in pain. And I think that reinforces what some of us believe that when we're in pain, I don't need nobody. When you're in pain, God always sends you somebody. God always sends you somebody. You're not weak because you're in the season of pain. encourage you to find balance. How to balance the two. You got to be able to balance the two well. I've seen people that I've dedicated a 
million dollar business. And we're celebrating how awesome it is to, for their business to be celebrated for a million dollars. And then the next day, their son dies in a plane, in a boat crash. How joy and pain live in the same house. Guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, this is life. It'd be easy for me just to say, like, oh, y'all, y'all, be, y'all lives are going to be full of joy, and it's going to be the best days of your life, and everybody high five their neighbor, but then life happens. Some things are going to happen, and you just ain't going to have no words for it. You just got to know how to balance it. Don't get so heavy on joy and don't get so heavy on pain. They want to pull you. If you stay in pain too long, you get in depression. If you stay in joy too long, you become a narcissist. be saying, well, why in the world would I want to be saved if I got to go through joy and pain? Whether you're saved or not, you still got to go through it. The difference is you don't suffer alone. At the highest point of your life could also be the lowest point of your life. Can I get somebody to testify that that's true? Come on, saints. Can you say have the highest point of your life and have the lowest point at the same time? It is a part of life. But I want you to know what I need you to know. This is my anthem. This is what I believe. This is what I know. Every day that you are alive means that God has confidence in you, that you can survive and make it through the day. I don't know how I'm going to make it through the year. I'm figuring out how I'm going to make it through the day. Once I make it through this day, I'm going to figure out how I make it to tomorrow. Once I make it through tomorrow, I'm going to make it to tomorrow. But here's my resolution. If Satan is going to make you go through pain, you better make him pay every day that you live. Every single day that I live, I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to make you pay for every tear I cry, every frustrated season. I am going to make you pay. Why? Because it's in Your mama can't help you through this. Your daddy can't help you through this. Your pastor can't help you through this. There are some things pain got to teach you by itself. I know you can't touch your neighbor. Don't touch him. Look at him say, tighten up. Look at him say, tighten up. In the balcony, look at them and say, tie enough. Joy and pain are part of life, y'all. How you manage it determines how you live. I want to pray to you, Father, I thank you that we got to figure out joy and pain, but we don't have to figure it out alone. So I, I pray, God, that you'll help my brother and sister might be experiencing the worst level of pain that they've ever thought of. That you are with them. God, there's some people in this church, they're so hard on themselves. They beat themselves up because of the things that have happened in their life and they just live in a constant season of pain. But help them to know Help them to understand 
that joy and pain are a part of following this cross. Strengthen them so that they can be strong enough to endure when they grow tired. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.